So, um, I would like to welcome everybody. I think we we are ready to start now. So, I'm very honored to have this uh, this very prominent round here of some of the most respected leaders of central banks in the world. We do have the the former president uh, of European Central Bank, Monsieur Trichet. We do have um, the president of Poland uh, National Bank, Mr. Belka. We do have uh, Jacob Franco. Uh, for a long time, he was president of the. Uh, he was governor of the Bank of Israel, and we do have Mogur I Sarescu, the governor of the Central Bank of Romania. Um, when I did prepare actually for this session, I was thinking about all this uh, discussion we had about the policy of central banks in the world with uh, quantitative easing and all these things. But now with uh, having so dramatic things going on in Europe and all over the world, so I would actually like to open with another question. I would actually like to ask Mr. Trichet, um, when I heard this, uh, this news in tomorrow morning again that we have uh, terrorist attacks in uh, Mali, I just wanted to know from him, who actually has a lot of experience in what, what is going to happen in economies after terrorist attacks, is he actually awaiting that this terrorist attacks we see now in Europe is going to impact the, the economy of Europe and the world? Well, <coughs> I have to say we are far from uh, central banking, of course, uh, with this question. Uh, <clears throat> to respond very briefly, I, my own understanding is that after the previous attacks of that kind in Madrid, in London, elsewhere uh, in the world, we have, of course, and we always had an immediate impact, which was not negligible, of course, on confidence, on the uh, overall attitude of economic agents in general, household and uh, firms. But in the cases I have uh, mentioned, it appeared that it was a transitory phenomenon and it was not a lasting one. Of course, provided it appears that the necessary measures are taken and that the resolve of the people and peoples concerned and the resolve of the authorities is such that it recreates confidence, which I expect will be the case, even if, of course, uh, what we have observed was particularly dramatic and uh, extremely moving. The fact that we have now in Africa a new phenomenon of that kind with the 170 hostages, if I understand well, in Mali, is of course uh, something which uh, uh, is adding to this uh, emotion. But again, it's a global phenomenon. It's a, a global uh, uh, challenge, a global uh, enemy, which is uh, uh, crystallizing in many places all over the world with pre-announcement that it is really something global. Uh, but again, uh, I, my own working assumption is it will have an impact, but it is transitory and will get out, as was the case in the past, from this transitory period. Um, if I ask you, Mr. Frankl, you had a very big experience with all with things like this happening in Israel. You see then government spending more money on, uh, on defense. This has an impact on... Uh, on the stability of a country. Do you think this is going to work, uh, this is going to weigh so soon as Mr. Trisha said, or do you think this is going to be a lasting impact for years? Well, the answer depends on what will be done. Uh, the reality is that the immediate impact of uh, atrocities of this kind are more, are of course, there is the human toll, which we should never underestimate, but when we go to the macro global picture in and of itself, they are not of the dramatic sense in the, in the sense that growth of economies are not going to be altered per se. 
What is important, however, is that in some circumstances, some sectors are going to be more impacted, especially the tourism sector. If I look at Egypt, this is a very important issue. But I feel, like Jean-Claude Trichet, that the key, we should look at it also, not only as a challenge, but also as an opportunity. This is a situation where there is in a, an extraordinary opportunity to exert, demonstrate leadership. If there is leadership that recognizes that one does not talk about a local phenomenon, but one talks about a global phenomenon, and leadership that recognizes that a global phenomenon needs to be addressed with global perspective, with global solidarity, then I believe that there might be something positive that will come out of it. It is a terrible reality, but there is no question in my mind that with the appropriate addressing of that reality, uh, it will be receiving its right dimensions. It should not become a macro issue, but it, it depends on a macro approach to ensure that it does not become a macro issue. Thank you very much. As far as I, I understand it and I see it in the, in the news, it's kind of with all this, all this crisis, the crisis about the refugees in, Euro, in Europe, all the, the, the discussion about the stability of the, of the Euro did go away a little bit. Is this actually just an impression that I have or is this something that you think so too? I would like to ask this. Mr. Belka, who is actually, his country is not a member of the European uh, currency. So what do you think? Is this actually the, the, crisis, of, the crisis of Euro has gone away now? Or is this just the news that has gone away from, uh, from this? Well, all the problems that the Eurozone has, and I would prefer to call it the problems of the Eurozone rather than the problems of the Euro, uh, have not gone away, but they are at least momentarily dwarfed by by the refugee crisis and uh, and uh, particularly the crisis uh, that comes from the terrorist uh, threat uh, on Europe and and basically not only on Europe. So. Uh, Yes, we deal with, uh, and we have to deal with the refugees, with, the, with terrorism, but of course the problems with Greece, the problems with the fundamental issues of uh, Eurozone uh, sustainability or currency, uh, currency zone sustainability have not gone away. Is this actually the, the impression that you have in uh, Romania too? More or less that um, on one side, I could say that the refugee crisis added to already several problems in the Eurozone, but uh, just when the discussion, discussion started, I recall uh, the farewell dinner several years ago with Professor Ising, when he said finally that uh, Euro is an unfinished project that is impossible to stay only on one pillar, meaning the monetary policy, that the other two pillars, meaning the fiscal, uh, joint fiscal policy, and um, also kind of uh, more political cooperation is absolutely necessary to have a, uh, a stable euro. Then uh, the perception in Romania is something like this. We like to join euro, we have only a waiver, we, try to have the mastery criteria. Uh, and we already have met all the mastery criteria, but uh, we understood, particularly from Greece experience, that only nominal convergence is not enough. Uh, sustainability of uh, nominal convergence is a key word, meaning also a kind of a real convergence and uh, a general convergence. And then we have to wait up to the moment when we are better prepared and when the Eurozone is in a better shape, you say. The Eurozone in not a very good shape. Um, Mr. Trisha, you started actually as being the first uh, 
pre uh, president of the of this united currency is you started with uh, with actually statements about about uh, stability and with a completely different agenda that uh, from that that we see now did actually the consensus about how uh, how a, uh, a central bank should be governed change since you, you started? <coughs> if you permit, I will uh, first perhaps be um, compliment what has just been said by our two colleagues. Um, you can present things in a quite different fashion. You could say from the very beginning, the euro as a currency was considered with great skepticism. I am my, myself a witness of that when I was in New York or uh, in Asia before the creation of the euro. The idea was either it's impossible or it would be a total failure, the currency. And in any case, it's impossible to have a credible currency starting from scratch with so many different uh, uh, currencies merging. And the other, uh, I would say, uh, bias against what we were doing in Europe was, it goes without saying, that if you have to go through a very grave financial crisis, the euro as a currency will disappear and the euro area will be dismantled. Now, what happened? Because we had the stress test. The stress test was the worst financial crisis ever since World War II, which perhaps could have been the worst financial crisis since World War I had the central banks not reacted everywhere in the world very, very boldly and swiftly. What happened was exactly the contrary of what was anticipated. First, the currency proved to be credible, to inspire confidence, and to preserve stability. To the, extent, to the extent that the main criticism against the currency was it's too strong for a currency which was supposed to disappear it was very paradoxical, and I experienced that myself, as you know, uh, being president. Second, how many countries were in the euro area when we had Lehman Brothers collapse? 15, 15 countries in the euro area at that very moment. We went through the worst crisis ever since World War II. How many of the 15 are still there? 15, including Greece, because 69% of the Greek people in all survey, proved that they wanted to stay. And that the only reason why Greece is still there. It is the will of the people. And four new countries got in, four new countries, the three Baltics and Slovakia. So that we are 19 now. The four new countries entered in the time of the crisis. So I only mention that not to say it's a fantastic success, only to say it is much more resilient than was anticipated by the overwhelming majority of observers. Second, the real success will be growth and jobs in the medium and long term. And we have to work actively on that. And I share entirely the views expressed by Mugur. We have to continue constructing Europe in improving the executive branch side of the euro area and in improving the I would say, democratic legitimacy of the euro area. And these are the two directions where we, we need a lot of hard work. Are you really sure that uh, actually people really support the euro as much as you say? I mean, if you would vote here in Switzerland, nobody would support being member of, uh, of uh, this currency. If you would vote in Germany, people would say no. If probably if even- You're totally wrong, sir. I'm very sorry to say that. In Germany, precisely, we have one of the most important support for the currency. Paradoxically, as well as in Greece, as I just said, approximately the same level. In Switzerland, uh, I have no doubt on your position, knowing also that you do not want to be a member of the United Nations organization. So you have a, a lot of uh, very good reasons, perhaps, not to enter the European Union. But no, I, I think don't trust all what is said, usually. Uh, what surprised me very much, when I look at the last Eurobarometer in Europe, you know, it's a survey which is done every six months by the Commission. I was very impressed by the fact that there is no confidence for 
any institution or any leaders, quote unquote, in general in Europe. But there is paradoxically more confidence for the European institution than for the national institutions. More confidence for the European Parliament than for the national parliaments. More confidence for the Commission, which is extremely paradoxical, uh, than for the European go national government. So it means our people are not satisfied, and they have very good reason for that. They have no confidence in their leadership, and we have to reconstruct that. But to say that Europe is rejected generally is not what I observed in the survey. Ariel said so positive about what is going on in Europe and especially with the Euro too, Mr. Frankel. Well, by way of uh, answering this question, I will refer first to the preceding question, where you put on the same level in your question the refugees challenge and the Euro challenge. Historically speaking, the creation of the Euro and the management of the Euro is a fantastic development. It's a huge change. And of course, the effort to maintain it and strengthening it is in place. Nothing is perfect, but uh, you can call it work in progress, but there is progress. There is underlying understanding of what's the root cause of the challenges, and that's why people talk now about the banking union and things of that type. When it comes to the refugees, of course, as you indicated correctly, it takes the headlines and the attention of leadership, and maybe properly so for now, but there we are as far from a solution as one can be. We have to understand the solution to the refugees issue is not the question of who will absorb so many refugees, but rather we need to understand why do we have these refugees and how do we reduce the flow and the need to become refugee? Because the reservoir of the millions and millions of people who are potential refugees is so big that there is no way that the discussion that is now taking place of who will absorb how many can solve it. So the fundamental solution is not how to deal with the current refugees, which is a short-term challenge, but how to ensure that there are no future refugees, and this requires a much more dramatic political decisions and political actions in the global scene. So uh, in this regard, I'm obviously uh, sharing Jean-Claude Trichet's fundamental optimism about the euro because I, the way, how does one become optimistic or pessimistic? You know, it's a matter of, uh, it's not a matter of character. I'm an optimistic guy, so, but still, the question is, what is my expectations? What could have happened and what has happened? We are much more advanced than what could have happened within the euro area, and it is in this regard I'm more optimistic. We are less advanced in the refugees, and therefore I'm not optimistic. I'm not seeing addressing the source of it, and therefore I'm even a little pessimistic. I leave, the, I leave this issue. Um, do you think that, uh, that actually the problems we have with, uh, with refugees, the, it seems for, uh, from an economic standpoint, it's not, it's not a very big issue in a ways. But it is a big issue for a European community because it could blow up the whole, the whole system there. What do you think uh, in, in Poland, actually? Is this, is this more important for you uh, than the, the possibility of joining the, the euro or, let's say, the, the, the challenge that we have with the euro crisis? Well, it's... <laughs> unusual for central bankers to discuss refugee crisis mm. and how to <clears throat> how to stem the flow the inflow of uh, immigrants refugees uh, to Europe uh, but let me try to draw a parallel between the euro um, stress tested during the recent uh, um, financial crisis of the world and, uh, and the European 
integration, the European project of integration being stress test now uh, by this uh, un, un, uh, unprecedented uh, international situation. Well, we should remember that Europe has uh, taken and absorbed uh, broadly, successfully, tens of millions of uh, immigrants, uh, refugees, you prefer, in the, in the uh, last decades. Uh, and of course, it didn't go without problems, and uh, uh, I don't need to say this to the French, but the Swiss, the Swi well, m m mostly, this problem, uh, this, 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 this phenomenon of, of immigration was a source of uh, dynamism, uh, alleviating to a certain extent demographic uh, misery of, uh, of Europe. Well, now we have a different situation. It's not only about the numbers, uh, it's about general circumstances of this uh, immigrant or, or refugee inflow. It's the wave of terrorism, it's the war, uh, it's the war that uh, has no precedent in our, uh, as far as our memory goes back, uh, atrocities committed by the, by the uh, whatever you name it, I see or whatever. Uh, so this creates a different uh, uh, atmosphere among the people, among the peoples. Uh, even those, well, we in Poland, we have uh, taken about 85,000 Muslims from Chechnya. Uh, well, many of them uh, moved uh, away to other countries, but most of them, or some of them stayed. Chechens are not among the uh, most moderate Muslims, I must say, and it didn't pose any problem, any political, any, uh, um, let's say, um, assimilation problem uh, to, to our country with this. Now, it's different. It's not about the numbers. I mean, the numbers we are talking about in my country are, are peanuts, a few thousands. And the problem is the overall atmosphere. It's the war. I don't know. Well, this is a, this is a very serious stress test for the European integration, for whether Europe will address this issue in a, in a community, in a community uh, way, in a commu communitarian perspective. You know, Euro, you may say it's a great success. It has been a great success. And it survived the crisis. Yes, we have problems with uh, uh, certain, uh, let's say, cohesion among the Eurozone countries, uh, divergence being the, the, the key issue. But Whenever Europeans do something together, like trade policy, they become a superpower. And Google is more afraid of uh, Miss uh, Vestager than of anyone else in the world. Uh, so maybe it's time to rethink European foreign policy, European uh, military policy, because I'm not an expert, and certain bankers, you should not have provoked us into this. But, <laughs> but if there is anything similar be between, uh, between the refugee crisis and the, and the, and the stress-testing euro, it's that whenever we do it in common, we are much more successful than if we try to do it, let's say, chaotically, one by one. Okay, let's, let's move away a little bit from this issue and, and go back to what actually did unite most of the, of the leaders of, of central banks in the world. This, this was actually the reaction on the financial crisis. It seems that there is, the, there is a common sense about how we should actually deal with crisis 
like this now, which is completely different from what we thought about in, in the year 2000. So it seems that uh, the group of, of 30 has, new, has a new proposition. Mr. Frankel, can you tell us a little bit more on, on about the learnings and what, what do you see in the future on how to deal with financial crisis and the consequences of it? Thank you. Uh, since uh, some of you may not be familiar with the organizational setting of the Group of 30, the Group of 30 is composed of 30 individuals, and uh, in fact, both Jean-Claude and I are now in the leadership of this group. I'm the chairman of the trustees, and Jean-Claude is the chairman of the group. What is unique about this group is it is composed primarily of uh, current and former central bank governors. The reason why I mention it is that uh, after so many years since the beginning of the crisis, uh, there was the time to take stock and say, what have we learned? One statement of modesty to begin with. In 2007, in the height of the crisis and the beginning of the unconventional monetary measures, etc., no single governor if you asked him to put in an envelope a date that he believes that this detour, that these unconventional measures will finish, nobody expected that in 2015, in November, we will talk yet about the very issues of unconventional policies. It was perceived at the time more as a short-term detour to solve a problem. So it turned out to be, have become something more fundamental. We understand now also why it's a different current character of crisis, and some colleagues like uh, Ken Rogoff and Reinhardt ex even wrote a book, which is called This Time It's Different. The rationale is that some of the crisis is really what we call balance sheet crisis that requires long-term adjustment. One of the issues that came out of this report which we call the fundamentals of central banking lessons from the crisis, is first, we have learned a lot, but don't throw the old textbook away. There is still a lot of wisdom in it. There were new chapters into it, but it's not a very new world. It's a very modified world, which means that the basic mandate of central bank should still be medium-term price stability, that the mechanism by which central bank can exercise its capabilities is by having central bank independence from the political pressures. Recognizing, and that's the new part, that uh, we are now in a world in which financial markets are so important that financial stability must be also part of the mandate of central bank. But we also observed that there are too many articles that say that central banks are the only game in town, and we don't like it. We don't like it because while it is kind of a complimentary thing, wow, we are the only game in town, there is no way that without the strong support of governments in both the fiscal side, but more importantly, the structural side, that we can generate growth. And at the end of the day, sustainable growth is the ultimate objective. So one of the pleas in the report is, yes, to extend the mandate to include financial stability, to extend the instrument to include what is called macroprudential instruments, to recognize, however, that central banks cannot do it alone and therefore we need to have a much greater involvement of governments, to recognize that in the system of an international setting, the best ways to shield you and others from financial shocks that happen elsewhere is through flexible exchange rates, and to make sure that uh, all of this is done in a very transparent way, an accountable way, so communication between central bank and the economic system is key. The idea is not surprise the markets, 
but in a way prepare the markets. And what we see today, for example, in the Federal Reserve is the par excellence example of how you prepare the market. When things will happen, you will not be surprised anymore. There was some, some time ago a surprise which did not work well. It only illustrates how important it is to have the transparency and good communication with the market. Um, in the discussion before, and I heard Mr. Monti saying that we are actually lacking uh, leaders in Europe and in the US, so the, the central banks have a much more prominent uh, role than they actually should have. Do you share this, uh, this uh, point of view, Mr. Trichet? I don't share entirely the view that uh, leadership is particularly poor at the present moment, and I refer to the last uh, reaction after the dramatic events which were mentioned a moment ago. So we will see. I mean, uh, what we have to, to see is the resolve, of, as I said already, and Jacob echoed that, of the authority and of the people. And uh, I expect that this resolve will be absolutely obvious. But to, to respond to your, uh, to your question, uh, central bankers had to cope with the worst crisis ever, as I said, probably since World War I. Had we not had swift and extremely bold reaction, first at the level of central banks, then at the level of governments, we would have uh, had, in my uh, understanding, a great depression that would have been much, much worse than the great recession that we had to cope with. And I'm speaking particularly, of course, of the advanced economy, economies. So in those circumstances, it's not surprising that those who were on the front line, and these were the central bankers, and had, again, to cope with these absolutely exceptional circumstances, uh, well, very fortunately, they were up to their responsibilities. They took those bold decisions as early as, uh, uh, I would say, August 2007, for instance, in Europe, we decided to supply liquidity on an unlimited basis to all commercial banks, and we were asked 95 billion euros, and we gave 95 billion euros. These decisions were taken in two hours and a half by the executive board, because we were in presence of something which was totally unexpected. The Central Bank of the United States took extremely bold decisions, so bold that they were highly criticism, uh, a lot of criticism against these bold decisions. Still, until now, I take it that they were absolutely right to take these bold decisions. And again, of course, uh, when you have to react to such dramatic circumstances, you're very visible and it creates the sentiment that uh, you are the only game in town, as Jacob said. But of course, it's not true at all. We were reacting very boldly on the liquidity front, and all of us asked the governments to be uh, themselves able to reassure uh, the market participants, the investors and savers uh, in the advanced economy and in the entire world, that they were also behind and the, finally, all uh, heads of state and government uh, said in various fashions, in various modalities, uh, there, will be, there will not be a new Lehman Brothers in my courtyard. And it was said in the US, in Europe, in the UK, uh, in the euro area. Uh, only to show that uh, uh, what made the feeling at the very beginning that we were prominent was that we were on the front line and we had to react extremely rapidly. After Lehman Brothers, at a moment where some uh, executive branches were still saying it's normal to have bankruptcies in market economies and they were trying to play down the importance of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, all central banks uh, uh, concerned were in close contact to work out the response. And we were able in two days to have all our decision-making processes to agree on the same text, the same communique, and the same response at a global level with publication on, on the Thursday following the Monday of the drama. So only to show uh, that, but again, uh, we are not alone. We must not be alone. We should not accept 
to be considered as the only game in town. And one of the message that uh, Jacob, who was not only the chair of the trustee in the G30, but also the leader of the work which has been done on central banking and on the fundamentals of central banking, as he said, the, the main message, one of the main message is that the other partners, namely governments, executive branches, parliaments, and also the private sector, have to be there, have to mobilize themselves because the central banks cannot be responsible for stability, growth, job creation, and the rest. Uh, we are, have to get all the other partners on board for good policies, structural reforms, and all what is needed to elevate the growth potential of our uh, economy. When I, when I see Ms., uh, your neighbor, Mr. Isarescu, he actually has a role that is probably even more difficult than being uh, the, the leader of the Central Bank in Europe, because I think the, the political environment where you have to, the, or that you have to deal with is even more unstable in uh, Romania, but you have always been stable. The currency has always actually followed more or less in a stable way. What do you think about this, this, uh, this leadership of the, of the politician and your leadership of the, of the central bank? Is the, how, did you actually, how could you actually survive in, a, in an environment that has been politically very unstable? <coughs> um. My opinion is that uh, the leadership is necessary to be political. They have the democratic uh, legitimacy. They are elected. The technocrats uh, could be from time to time in uh, more or less difficult periods, but for limited periods could be in the front line. Uh, and I was there. Right? I was for one year prime minister and I returned to the central bank. And I realized once again that uh, the political life is tougher, quite tougher than the, the central banking. Um, but again, we could provide uh, experience, we could provide, to say, professionals, and we did this in the past. Now, one uh, lessons which I learned from my experiences to understand that independence of the central bank is not a kind of isolation, that it's an active independence, uh, a kind of working with the government, keeping the independence, keeping your mandate, uh, looking to your goals, which are put into the law, but working with the government and uh, having all the skills which of course, they are developed in time to understand that also the political life is not simple. And uh, uh, sooner or later, you have to understand that the politicians are in front of the, uh, to say, population. And they have to deal with, uh, first of all, with the crisis. We have also our, our job in this direction. But uh, uh, from my point of view, this is crucial to, to have a kind of understanding. Uh, of the politicians. Secondly, is uh, uh, that to realize that uh, we, we had from the very beginning the mandate of uh, price stability, which is now a consensus, at least in Europe, among the central bankers. <laughs> but um, we, we, we had from the very beginning uh, another task, which the transformation of the banking system in Romania from a monobank to a two-tier banking system, to privatize the banks, to have uh, the foreign banks entering in, to bring in Romania the capital, to say, education, financial sector, to bring in also, to say, experience, expertise. That uh, we try to do also this job, which in a way or another could be called Herculean to, uh, to have this kind in 20 years of huge transformation of, uh, of the banking sector, alongside with trying to keep uh, the, um, uh, the price stability, medium and long-term price stability. And another aspect which I like to stress, also from uh, my experience, was the fact that uh, I kept in mind what one day Professor uh, uh, Charles Goodhart said, 
with the central bankers are always looking to all three aspects of uh, stability. Price stability, financial stability, and external currency stability. Of course, in different proportion history. Then, if I try to look into the future of the central bank banking, I have to look a little bit in, into the past to get some light. And uh, I could say, in, at least in our case, we had never the luxury. We had never the luxury in these 20 years to look only to the price stability. Because financial stability created mostly by the transformation process, and also when we fully liberalize the capital account by the capital flows, which are very volatile, and anyway, they are not looking to the rule of uh, um, the, the, to say, um, policy rate, which it's impossible to, to deal with the policy rate for keeping price stability in the same time to keep also financial stability. Then we developed gradually what we called, before the crisis erupted, an unorthodox monetary policy, unorthodox monetary policy. Now they are called always uh, uh, in Europe, and I could say in several countries in the world, they are called macroprudential uh, instruments and macroprudential policies looking at least to, uh, to financial stability. Currency stability, external stability, proved in Romania, and I discussed many times with uh, Marek Belka, Governor Belka, about this, a uh, highly sensitive issue in a country like Romania. Interest, uh, exchange rate was looked most, mostly and much more comparative with interest rate, like uh, indicator of good or bad. That's if the exchange rate was depreciating. The public understood that the country is not moving in the right direction. More than this, if the exchange rate appreciated, we're faced with, a, uh, to say, a real problem of forex credit, stimulating forex credit, putting risk. Then try to look also to the uh, exchange rate uh, stability in a kind of a sliding corridor, as I learned in the 70s when the Jacob Frankel was governor from Bank of Israel, uh, was something which I considered it also good. It's not at all simple to have only one instrument, the po policy rate, the interest rate, to deal with all these aspects, that we have to develop also other instruments. And we didn't keep idle reserve requirements, for example, or other prudential measures when it was necessary to, to deal. And just to mention, also, Jean-Claude Richer, he understood me in 2006 when I tried to explain that increasing the interest rates to, uh, to say, to slow down inflation uh, in Romania, which was higher than in Europe, was not the best instrument because this was stimulating forest credit. And actually, the aggregate demand was not increasing because of the local currency credit, but because of forex credit. And this was a byproduct which I never realized was so, uh, to say, poisoning when we privatized the state-owned banks. Then uh, for uh, emerging uh, small open economy, emerging economy, and being in Europe, we had to, uh, to use different uh, instruments. We had not to be dogmatic. And up to now, we uh, were at the least uh, reaching uh, the, the, both the price stability and financial stability. In Romania, this kind, no, no, can, no bank uh, was uh, supported by taxpayer with any penny. In uh, Poland, you had a more or less similar situation at the beginning, like in uh, Romania, but you, you actually managed to come out uh, pretty, pretty soon and pretty good. Um, what, what did actually Poland do different from other countries that they did they, they did su succeed actually to to uh, come closer to what is uh, Western European life standard than other countries? Well, uh, if I were to stick to monetary policy, uh, I would say the following: uh, according to whatever textbooks we have a small open economy like Poland, uh, which is basically a 
uh, currency uh, periphery to a great uh, big um, currency, which is Euro, we have no capability of pursuing um, successfully uh, um, an independent monetary policy. We uh, should not be able to, to do it. We should not uh, control uh, the uh, um, inflows and outflows of capital. We should not uh, uh, control uh, exchange rate movements. Uh, as to the financial stability, which is the stability of banks, basically, this is uh, another tricky issue as in both our countries, the ownership of foreign financial institutions is um, dominant, uh, maybe not to the same extent as in the Czech Republic or in the Baltics, but, uh, but still dominant. Well, fortunately, uh, the world is not uh, like, uh, like um, uh, theoretical models. And uh, we have a lot of leeway both to choose the level and dynamics of interest rates on the one hand to prevent unwanted inflows and outflows of capital. Okay, not ideally. We have suffered from, a, from an inflow of capital in, in, in the way of um, uh, carry trade, uh, uh, feeding uh, foreign exchange uh, loans, which, you know, Switzerland has its own share in this. Uh, uh, <laughs> but we also managed to keep Zwote relatively stable, relatively stable, and exactly because it's a floating uh, exchange rate regime. But this is this is the monetary this is the monetary policy. If we were to answer your question in a broader <coughs> sense, what did Poland do differently? I don't think we did anything so different from, say, Romania or most countries in the region. What we, uh, what we did is basically we ascribed to become the member of the European Union as early as 1991. Now only we realize how exotic it must have sounded to our partners like Jacob and Jean-Claude Trichet. But we treated acquis communautaire very seriously from the very beginning of, of, the, of, the, of the changes. And well, we imposed on ourselves uh, the, the rules of the game. Uh, we uh, reformed. Uh, after 15 years of reforms, it brought uh, fruits. Is it actually Easy. an exotic thing? It takes to only take, 15 years. Is it exotic to take a treaty seriously? Is it exotic in Europe to, to treat, uh, to, uh, to, to take this, this treaty seriously? Was it like this? Mr. Which treaty? Trichet? I mean, the, the rules that, that you accepted, you accepted the rules of the European community. You did actually what you had to do in a way. But if you look at uh, the history of, of Euro, you had many countries or at least one, no, let's say five countries at least that didn't actually um, do what they should do under the treaty of, uh, of the European stability. But is this something that we have to accept in the future too or is this going to be different? Um, it's very clear that in the case of Poland, uh, as Marek explained very well, and he has himself the the, I would say, multi-ocular vision of somebody who has been Minister of Finance, Vice my, uh, Prime Minister and Prime Minister of Poland, uh, as well as a central banker. So <laughs> when you, you speak on these structural reforms, it reminds me all the courage what, uh, what, which was needed to, to go through it, uh, respecting the rules, because it was, you know, accelerating the acquis communautaire. Now, to respond to the governance of the euro area, which is of a different nature. Your question is concentrating on governance of the euro area. It's absolutely clear that it was an enormous mistake, in my opinion, for France and Germany to give credit to the idea that the Stability and Growth Pact should not be respected. And it was uh, their position in 2003-2004 uh, uh, under the 
chairmanship of uh, Italy, to be frank. So the three big countries were allied to say, well, finally, the Stability and Growth Pact uh, does not deserve to be respected. I think it was the most dramatic mistake which was made in terms of governance of the euro area. Uh, I was just appointed myself uh, president of the ECB, and my first speech in the European Parliament was to say the Stability and Growth Pact is integral part of the single currency area. We were very bold. We decided to have a single currency without having a federal government, a political federation, a federal budget. So the framework, the fiscal framework, is absolutely key. Very unfortunately, it was not the position of neither the big countries nor finally the council. And uh, we, uh, even if we saved a large part of the uh, letter of this uh, Stability and Growth Pact, we lost the spirit of the pact. That being said, it's the, not the only problem. We also, uh, uh, in the ECB, uh, discovered that there was no real monitoring of the competitiveness indicator inside the euro area. And of course, in the crisis, we discovered that the absence of banking union was a big, big uh, drawback for the uh, euro area as a whole. So that we have now, as a lesson from the crisis, reinforce the Stability and Growth Pact, and I take it that it has to be respected. We are in a single currency area. We paid a terrible price for not respecting the framework. The framework is there. It's been reinforced in the crisis. It has to be respected. Uh, second, we have now the MIP, the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, which is a second pillar for governance and concentrate on competitive indicators, domestic and external imbalances, including current account imbalances inside the euro area. It is, in my opinion, as important as the Stability and Growth Pact, MIP as important as SGP, and we have now the banking union. So two new pillars for the governance of the euro area have been created in the crisis as lesson for, uh, drawn from the crisis. As I already said, I think these, of course, new pillars of governance have to be fully applied, uh, implemented, and respected. And that, that being said, we need, as I said, to reinforce the executive branch. I'm for a minister of finance and a ministry of finance of the euro area, uh, not only to care for the governance, the fiscal, the economic, and the financial governance of the euro area, but also to represent the euro area in the international institutions. And I take it also that uh, we must have a more assertive European Parliament in the format of the MPs that are representing the euro area in order to be sure that we have a, a I would say, last word, which is given in a manner which would be unchallengeable demo democratically when we have very difficult problems to solve, for instance, conflict between Greece and the European institutions and other problems of that kind. So uh, we have still a lot of hard work to do. But first, let's apply what we just decided. Uh, Mr. Frankel, you actually uh, looking at this probably more from a, from a from point of view from the outside, probably from an American point of view, and if you ask uh, actually people in, in the US, they didn't ever really understand this, uh, how, how the Europeans tried to manage crisis with stability pacts and everything. They always said this is never going to work, and at the, at the end they have been right, it didn't work, so the European bank did do something else. What do you think about these uh, statements of Mr. Trichet now? Well, uh, you asked the wrong person because I am known as somebody who normally agrees so much with Mr. <laughs> Trichet. Uh, so you will not be able to put a wedge here. Uh, I must say, and I, this was my first remark, that I think that the European project in historical dimensions is one of the biggest projects that uh, modern humanity has been there because it has much wider implications, much beyond currencies. It has, remember the context in which it was all initiated in the post-world war. 
Second World War. So, uh, of course, there were skepticisms. There are those who are still skeptic, but with the passage of time, people now know that this is part of the scenery. It's not something that the scenery will change, although the windows will be polished and maybe some paint will be added. <laughs> Let me return, however, to, you, to the subject that you started before, because we are all full of praise, and properly so, to the initial response to the crisis, where central banks and governments were really, in a way, saved the day. But like all medicines, there are uh, two elements to medicines. First, there are diminishing returns. Uh, QE1 was extremely effective. QE2 was effective, but a little less than QE1. QE3 was effective, but at least a little bit <coughs> less than QE2, etc. We have had a situation where interest rates have been now close to zero for a very long period of time. There was a good reason at the beginning, and now is the time to ask, are there unintended consequences that we need to prevent in order to indeed secure that saving the system is a permanent fixture? There is more and more understanding and realization that uh, much of the debate about normalization was about the cost of normalization. And of course, if you discuss the cost of normalization, the tendency is, let's delay it, because there is cost. I think that a more balanced discussion today should also be the cost of delayed normalization. What are the typical costs? Because in the modern era, when the financial markets are so important, and yields are close to zero, it provides incentives for everyone to look for yields elsewhere. And as you look for yields elsewhere, you typically end up in a situation that are more risky. Higher yields goes with higher risk. And normally it will come from areas that are less regulated. So from the system perspective, you have a little bit of a higher risk. We also know that assets, especially in the housing market, are are artificially inflated if interest rates are too low for too long. Bubbles typically happen when interest rates are low, not when interest rates are high. So those are all well-known facts, but it also says that if you feel that the economy is normalizing, then it's a good time to say policies should be normalizing. I can speak about the US, and that's not a secret. The US Federal Reserve has said very clearly there are three elements that we look at in order to decide what to do. Element number one is what happens to growth? Well, on this one, growth has improved significantly. There is no question that growth in the US has been resumed. Is it going to be less growth than the previous decade? Of course, hopefully so, because the past growth was not healthy growth. So I think that on the growth part, you can tick the box and say, ready to normalize. The second criterion is labor markets. We have had 10% unemployment a few years ago. We now have, in the US, 5% unemployment. The duration of unemployment is diminishing. Labor force participation, of course, is a little low. But by and large, all the results that looking at labor markets convinced most observers that you can tick the box and say, ready to normalize. The third element that they look at is what happens to wage and price pressures. There, current inflation is still very low, although even yesterday the numbers show a little bit of an upper tick. But as central bankers, they do not need to look at inflation today, which measures events of yesterday. They need to look at inflation tomorrow. A lot of arguments <coughs> were made that one of the reasons for the currently low price inflation in the US is reflecting a very sharp fall in commodity prices, which is spreading itself over time but will evaporate. A sharp change in the US dollar, which is also 
temporary by its nature and it's already correcting. So when all is said and done, they feel, many of them, that on the third box, inflationary pressure, wage pressures, either neutral or ready to go. And this is why everyone talks about December as the change. Let me tell you one point. When we meet here next year, and we will discuss the rate rise of the US, whether it was in December or next February or last September, history is not going to change by that. That's not critical. We are talking about 25 basis points when you start around zero, distance from the long term. But the issue is a strategy. And what the US is talking about is when should be the start of a journey. They do not hesitate of raising interest rates by 25 basis points. But they do, and properly so, ask, is this the time to start the journey? Because we are talking about a sequence of gradual rises over some time. I think that there is more and more discussion about this coming December. It's probably going to be a correct decision. But uh, the issue is it reflects a shift from discussion from cost of normalization to cost of delayed normalization and finding the balance. What do you think, in, uh, from a European perspective, do you think there should be a rise of, uh, of interest in Europe too? Well, uh, I am not sure whether I... I must sp can't jump in. It's easier to speak as a former central bank than as a <laughs> current central bank. <laughs> and Be Mark Belka always have very strict answers and clear. So if you don't see a clear answer, it is because he's a current central banker. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm going to provide a clear answer. As far as, uh, as the uh, interest, well, prospective interest rate increase in, uh, in the US, uh, we are not, uh, let's say, overly impressed. We are waiting for this. As a matter of fact, we think that uh, the procrastination is probably more destabilizing even on those countries that are uh, probably uh, more fragile uh, than we are, than, than the actual increase. So uh, I referred to this uh, in, my, in, my in my previous presentation, that, that we managed to, um, let's say, defend the country from excessive inflows and outflows. There was no really a big inflow of capital as a consequence of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, quantitative easing in America. So we are not expecting a, a big uh, outflow. Uh, if this is the sign of better economic health in the US, right. then why should we be afraid of it? And what about, what about in Europe? In Europe, you mean uh, the should we, bank? should we rise the, the interest rate too? Oh, well, 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 well. Here, <laughs> here we have a slightly different situation. Um, not, number one, um, I, I'm not sure whether this would uh, um, reflect uh, properly the official view of the of, uh, of the ECB. Uh, neither I will ask uh, Jean Trichet to do it. Uh, no, but, but as, uh, as but an I external observer, that, I have a sentiment that the Europeans uh, <laughs> should not and, and should not ignore the, the phenomenon of uh, lowflation or, or, or deflation. Um, we in Poland, we are currently as minus 0.7, minus 0 0.7 inflation, whatever negative inflation. Uh, but nobody is really. Uh, moved about it because wages are growing, uh, the, the uh, entrepreneurs, the companies are not complaining. Well, the only person that complains with good reason is the Minister of Finance. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, if I look at the situation in the Eurozone and the necessity to correct imbalances, to, um, to uh, correct for divergence, for, this, for some cases of divergence, which are now mitigated, as a matter of fact. Uh, then deflation on, or very low inflation may be detriment to this. And, and uh, I think, uh, um, well, it's, it's quite uh, justified for the ECB to, to be afraid of this and act against it. So it's, uh, it's ra raising uh, interests where, where it doesn't matter for you, but not raising them at home. 
Is this uh, your position too, Mr. Fischer? Well, uh, can I uh, reciprocate and ask whether you would call for an increase of rates in Switzerland, where the rates are at <laughs> minus 0 0.75, if I'm, if I'm That's true, yeah. <laughs> so, no, I mean, it's absolutely normal that uh, the central banks are concentrating on their own problem. The issues and the challenges in the United States are very different, obviously, at the present moment from the issues that we have. We are very united on the medium long-term goal. And by the way, we have the same definition of price stability on both sides of the Atlantic now. But of course, the cycle is not the same. The level of, uh, of pressure on uh, future inflation is not the same. And uh, it's absolutely clear that it is normal to have divergences in the day-to-day -day decisions that are taken on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I uh, certainly not spouse any remark of the kind, it's a drama, we will have divergences in the monetary policy of the major central banks. It's normal that you have divergences in the day-to-day -day decisions, or even in the cycle, but of course provided you have a great deal of unity on the medium long-term goal, which is the case, obviously. But we actually have a phenomenon that is kind of strange, we don't have I mean, one of the fundamental part of, of capitalism is actually interest, and there is no interest anymore. Is this actually just, it, does, it just doesn't matter? No, it matters a lot, and it is the reflection of uh, abnormal functioning of our economies, and particularly in the advanced economy. We have a very, very uh, deep degree of abnormal functioning, and that's the reason why we call the other partners to do their job. Because again, it's very abnormal for central banks uh, to be up to their responsibility in maintaining zero rates over a very long period of time. And it is the case in all advanced economies. There has been there, really, uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, because we had the worst crisis in the advanced economy again since World War II and perhaps World War I. So we, we are still in the shadow uh, of a very, very abnormal functioning of our economy. So uh, it's very abnormal, as said Jacob, there are a lot of unintended consequences, both of the zero rates and of the, I would say, unconventional measures, which by the way are uh, uh, QE on the one hand, you have the quantitative uh, unconventional measures, you have also the off-balance sheet commitments seen from, you know, uh, <coughs> maybe, maybe a very long distance, you could say at a time that the ECB is not doing as much as the Fed because you were looking at the size of the balance sheet. But the ECB always had, since the very, very beginning of the crisis, off balance sheet commitments, full allotment of all liquidity which is asked by the commercial banks at fixed rate, and the OMT. The OMT is an off-balance sheet commitment uh, to purchase treasuries if need be and if there is the appropriate conditionality. It's not in the balance sheet, but it's a very powerful commitment. I mentioned that en passant because it's uh, very often forgotten by the external observers. But if you look, if, uh, if you look at governments, I mean, they have they have their debts and they have their off-balance sheet, de balance sheet debts, and it's very comfortable to, for them to have more or less zero or even below in interest rate. Is, actually, is there actually too much pressure on national banks from the politics that just to do nothing and just to, to go on like this? What, what, is, what is the situation in uh, Romania? I mean... That, uh, First of all, uh, let me tell you that negative interest rates is not across the Europe. It's not in Poland, it's not in Romania. We have also negative uh, inflation. It's quite uh, pretty important. It's uh, more than minus one. But uh, the policy rate is 1.7%. That in real terms, I could say that uh, we have positive real interest rates and uh, not uh, very low. But we are not in the core of Europe. We are on the, on the border of Europe, and uh, <laughs> we, we, we have to look to the capital flows, as I said before, and to, um, to say also to the exchange rate. And, uh, 
what I could say that there is still room for reducing, uh, looking to the inflation, to reducing the uh, interest rate and keeping the interest rate pretty positive. But uh, we try to avoid this exactly to avoid the problems which uh, Jean-Claude said before. And uh, more than this, uh, we are not afraid of deflation like uh, is in other countries because we have seen that wages increasing very pretty rapidly, the domestic demand increased also pretty rapidly, that the industrial production in general, the GDP increased by between three and four percent, that uh, is not a clear sign of any deflation. Here that the peculiarity of uh, several countries in Europe uh, is important to take in view. Where we are looking particularly is not exact, exactly what uh, the, uh, America will do, the Fed will do. We are looking particularly what uh, the European Central Bank is going to do in the future, and particularly the peer countries. We are looking to Poland, Central Bank of Poland, we are looking to Central Bank of Hungary. And a, a short comment on the, the capital movement. Uh, here there is a volatility, as I have seen it, and there is also uh, less predictability. Well, it's very difficult to predict what is the capital movement. I recall last year, at the beginning of 2014, when there were some financial turbulences in Turkey, uh, the impact on Romania was pretty large capital outflows and pressures for depreciating currency. When the Ukrainian crisis erupted, we did expect the same to happen. It was not. It was totally contrary. We have seen large capital inflows and the large pressure for appreciating uh, the local currency. Perhaps migratory capital were uh, getting out from Ukraine, from uh, Russia, and uh, moving in Romania. That to uh, end my uh, uh, short presentation, to, to, to look only to the inflation, if it's negative or not, or to the fear of deflation in a small open economy is not enough. So I just hear from all these Europeans, uh, I hear why we shouldn't, why we shouldn't actually uh, do anything on interest rates. Are they all afraid? What do you think, Mr. Franco? They are not afraid. As uh, was indicated, Europe in a is in a different phase of the cycle. The U.S. started its actions early on. Europe started its actions a bit later. So we are now in a situation that if we want convergence for a while, they will move in opposite directions. While the US is discussing tightening, Europe still is discussing expanding, but there is no question that all of those are still unconventional measures and they are not yet the normal measures. Jean-Claude said properly so. Growth in Europe will not take place only by the ECB. So yes, we discuss about the ECB, but we eventually want to aim at sustainable growth. And that's why the message is again to governments and about structural measures. The more, if you really want to enhance normalization of interest rate policy, you must make sure that the economy is more flexible. A more flexible economy requires structural measures that will bring it about. Now, uh, let's face it. The European Central Bank has in a much, much tougher job than the Federal Reserve. The governance is bringing together representatives from so many countries. Although, officially, they leave their passports at home when they come to the ECB and they all become senior members of the European Central Bank, but, it is, but they come from countries with different political settings, where structural policies are there. So I am much more patient with the ECB and its challenges than with the Fed, and I think that's why we will see Fed normalization much faster than the ECB. Okay, now I think we are getting close to the end of the discussion. Maybe we can open uh, for the public. Is there, are there any questions here? Yes, here in the front. Microphone. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm uh, Meir Shitrit from Israel. The chance that we have four uh, presidents of uh, general uh, of banks. It is. I didn't hear an answer. I mean, a clear answer about the interest rate. <laughs> the situation in which in which the interest rates keeping zero or minus is creating a lot of damages in the economy of country. Am I speaking in my country? The fact that the zero that we have a zero interest rate create a big uh, sending most of the people to draw up, to draw from the banks all their savings and put it in the stock market. And you know, in the stock market, the people who lose their money are the poor people because they don't know what to do with their money. And the only way to do, they went with the money to certain brokers using the stock market as a chance. Or the other way, vice versa, other people who have money, they're going to the real estate investments, which they're taking, a matter of fact, as uh, Jacob said, as uh, risk is higher, also <coughs> profit could be higher. And one last thing, I see that in this situation, in, at least in my country, the governor of the bank, the president of the Bank of Israel, during the last years, were buying something like between 70 to 80 billion dollars from the market in order to try to influence the rate, the exchange rate between dollar and shekel. I personally think that it is stupidity. I don't think it's right. We cannot really is influence. She, is the lady? <laughs> no, I cannot. I don't agree with them. Of course, I think that uh, we're losing during this time. After five or six years of buying dollars in our market, the dollar had been changed a lot. Still, the rate, the exchange rate, stays almost the same without any any change. In the meantime, this kind of buying from the market creates, in my opinion, a lot of damages. I would, uh, I would really asking you. Why do, are you waiting for the Federal Reserve in order to raise the, the interest rate? Why country cannot raise it for itself? If you think it's a good thing to be done, why are you waiting for the Federal Reserve? <laughs> we, we are not the Federal Reserve. And we all expect uh, that the Federal Reserve will increase rates, obviously, because they have pre-announced uh, to the market that it was, they were really having all their options uh, open, and it's clear that the market is now understanding that it is very likely. But they cannot say, we, we'll, we are sure 100% to do that, because no central bank would never say that. But it's very well prepared and pre-announced, frankly speaking. For the rest, I would only say, uh, under the control of Jacob, because he's much more at stake, having been the, the governor, the, the central banks are not happy with what they do. What they do is because it's necessary under circumstances that are made horrible by the other partners, governments, parliaments, and I have also to say social, uh, private sector in some respect. Hopefully this is the last year that such a question can be asked. <laughs> uh, because we are really talking now about the US literally moving to the, to the exit. But, uh, you do bring an important issue that we cannot open now, but there is a really a very different set of considerations when it comes to two giant central banks like the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank versus the considerations to two, three small countries. And they need to decide, do they hook themselves to one of the large countries? Do they just become unguided missile in the space. I assume that in Israel, one of the considerations is the fear of lost competitiveness, that if, as if you raise your rate alone, your currency will appreciate, and this is another consideration. Hopefully, the big boys will get their act together, and then your question will be redundant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> other question over there? Nous comprenons que le rôle premier d'une banque centrale, c'est de gérer la politique monétaire et d'être le chien de garde de la monnaie. Cependant, il y a des cas où la banque centrale, comme c'est le cas par exemple au Liban, où elle crée sur ses réserves des leviers de financement de start-up ou création d'emplois. Ma question, quelles sont les limites 
euh, de, du rôle de la Banque centrale dans le développement économique du pays Ça, c'est ma première question. Ma deuxième question à M. Trichet est la suivante. Il y a des pays de la communauté européenne qui n'ont pas l'euro comme monnaie. Et il y a des pays qui ne sont pas dans l'euro, qui ont l'euro comme monnaie. Je donne l'exemple, le Monténégro, par exemple. Quelles sont les conditions pour un, un pays qui ne fait pas partie de l'Union européenne d'avoir une monnaie comme l'euro, comme monnaie nationale Merci. Poland, which is uh, not unusual for the whole Europe, uh, our mandate is clear. We have to um, be the guardian of stability of the currency, meaning uh, low inflation. We define it as 2.5%, slightly above what the ECB has, uh, around 2%. Uh, if it uh, does not contradict uh, with the main uh, job of the of the na of the s national bank it has to support the policy of the government what does it really mean in practice the constitution prohibits the central bank in poland to directly finance uh, state uh, expenditure Punto. What we can do is we can indirectly help financing growth, but on the secondary market. It's exactly what the ECB is now doing. It basically, and we have all the, uh, all the instruments to do it. Uh, there is no problem, really. The only uh, difference between a country like Poland, or I think Romania, and the European, uh, the Eurozone, is that uh, the banks are over liquid. And uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in 2008, so when the crisis erupted, uh, Central Bank of Poland proposed or offered to the, uh, to the commercial banks uh, instruments uh, very similar to the LTRO. Nobody showed up. Zero interest. Well, but that you have to work years to have such a situation. <coughs> we have the same, um, to say, mandate for price stability in Romania, like any uh, central banks of the uh, European system of the central banks. Uh, then, more or less, my answer is uh, like in the case of uh, Marek Belka. Uh, what we um, added in the last year was uh, a little bit more about financial stability. Also related to our functions, but also through a, a special committee where there are both the central bank, Ministry of Finance, and uh, the other, to say, uh, institution which is covering the supervision of the non-banking financial sector is uh, a kind of replica of the European uh, board for the systemic risk that uh, gradually we are putting into our mandate uh, also the role for the financial stability. Okay, maybe the second question and then one more last question from the public. Yeah, um, je vais répondre en français. La question était en français. Uh, sur le, un pays qui n'est pas membre de l'Union Européenne, euh, ou même qui est membre d'ailleurs de l'Union européenne et qui veut avoir euh, l'euro comme sa propre monnaie. C'est une décision qui est possible, qui a été prise, comme vous l'avez noté, par euh, un petit nombre de pays. Euh, ça peut revêtir des formes diverses, ça peut être une, une pure euroisation, ça peut être, euh, le cas échéant, un currency board. Euh, mais dans tous les cas, euh, c'est une décision unilatéral du pays en question. C'est lui qui prend cette décision, exactement comme certains pays en Amérique latine ont le dollar de par leur propre volonté. Et jusqu'à présent, euh, en tout cas certainement euh, dans, dans ma mémoire, 
de mon temps, nous n'avons jamais considéré que cela nous obligeait à quelque attitude que ce soit. C'était toujours, et nous avons toujours considéré que c'était totalement unilatéral. Ça a des conséquences relativement importantes parce que, comme vous le savez, pour entrer dans l'euro, il faut remplir un certain nombre de conditions et parmi ces conditions, il y a la stabilité de la monnaie dans le contexte du mécanisme de change. Si évidemment on a, on a un currency board qui relie complètement la monnaie nationale à l'euro, on a une sorte de stabilité automatique en quelque sorte et donc c'est un... C'est la raison pour laquelle euh, nous, nous tenons à ce que la responsabilité soit prise entièrement par le pays en question, sans implication de la Banque centrale européenne, ni d'ailleurs des institutions européennes. Pour le reste, je noterai effectivement que les, le targeted LTRO est typiquement euh, une opération de la Banque centrale qui a pour objet, en effet, de faciliter certains secteurs. Le, de mon temps euh, et, en, et du temps de Mario, on a eu trois programme 2 de mon temps, 1 du temps de Mario de Covered Bonds et où on achète des, des obligations garanties et là aussi on est en présence évidemment d'une opération qui aide certains secteurs en particulier. Euh, mais c'est vrai aussi que toutes ces opérations, en tout cas dans les pays avancés, sont nées avec la crise et qu'elles eussent été considérées anormales avant la crise. One last question, maybe. Here? Okay. Yeah, I'm Krishan Jindal from India. My, uh, <coughs> there is a large uh, population in developing countries which is uh, uh, financially excluded. Good number of families, they do not have uh, accounts with the banking, uh, banking system. This is a major challenge before the governments for uh, addressing poverty and employment generation, etc. And then there are certain sectors which are systemically very important, and banks are not able to sort of uh, take care of such sectors uh, the, in terms of uh, pro providing credit, etc. So my question to the panelist is, what could be the role of central banks in such uh, scenario? As a, matter, as a matter of fact, this is uh, a problem that we see also in uh, say, less advanced uh, countries of Europe, like Poland. Uh, we also have a, a sizable part of the population that uh, does not participate in the financial life, so to say. And, uh, well, our um, work here is, is the following. Uh, mm, number one, we try to limit the cost of uh, uh, of access to, uh, to banks, uh, to, uh, to uh, electronic uh, currency. Uh, we are very much helped by the European Commission uh, because uh, it's uh, on the initiative of the European Commission that we are introducing now so-called free of charge basic bank accounts, which we hope will encourage some of the people to, to become uh, customers. Um, but having said this, banks, commercial banks, are not always the best partners to serve micro, micro enterprises. Uh, for this, we, uh, we need a very diversified banking or, or financial sector. Um, I don't believe that the, that the banking sectors should be exclusively dominated by giants. Uh, we need small banks, we need uh, um, specific, uh, uh, let's say, micro-lending uh, institutions. And again, we feel uh, a support from, from Brussels. There are uh, regional uh, lending uh, schemes, uh, especially dedicated to very small enterprises. I'm not sure that they work properly, but this is the way that, uh, that, we, uh, that we deal in, 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 in Europe and also in Poland. And we, our role, central banks, is really to make it more popular and, and make people aware of this. 
Okay, thank you. Maybe would, one last word from, uh, from somebody just, of a financial just on, giant. Uh, <laughs> just on uh, this question. In fact, the, the country that you come from is used now as the role model of how to, to deal with these matters, how to advance microfinance programs, how to advance financial literacy programs. So this is something while the central bank cannot do it itself, it can support these kind of activities. And I heard recently a report from uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, our good friend Raghu Rajan, and from the minister describing the way in which, in fact, they almost forced millions and millions of people to have bank accounts by depositing their uh, various allowances, the subsidies, etc., into newly created bank accounts and therefore habits uh, became, uh, started to get formed. It's not a simple thing, but uh, this, is the kind, this is the kind of thing. We should not, however, uh, understand uh, this mandate as reducing the safety of the banking system. The banking system, the best way that central bank can serve the population is to secure the safety of the banking system. And having said this, there is an issue of information and education and literacy. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> thank you very much. I think we have to close. <laughs>